one more thing on the tithing. You know, uh, who's the father, fathers of our faith? In particular, one. Abraham. Hebrew, or, uh, Romans 4.12 says we're walking in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham. Was Abraham a tither? When did he tithe? Melchizedek. And then Isaac, it doesn't specifically say Isaac tithed, but I wouldn't doubt he did. But Jacob was a tither. Remember when Jacob was running from Esau in Genesis 28? And uh, Jacob's latter dream. And he woke up and said, God, if you'll be with me and be, you know, all this and bring me back to this land, I'll give a tenth. So here's two of, two of the three we know for sure of our fathers of our faith, as they're called. They were tithers long before the law. And tithe, so Abraham's the father of our faith. And we're children of Abraham. We're children of God. We're children of Jesus Christ. And so the tithing then was affirmed under the law. And I'm a firm believer that we should still tithe. Anybody in here want that blessing? I'll, you tithe, I'll open to you the windows of heaven. Malachi 3, I'll pour you out a blessing, and there shall not be what? Room enough to receive it. Anybody interested in that? And I would say this too, is you know, when a farmer plants a crop, does he expect a harvest? You know, when you plant a field, would the farmer say, well, I'm not really expecting anything out of this? They, they, they know it pretty well, whatever crop it is from seed dying to harvest, if the conditions are right, well, how long until that, that harvest comes in? We should expect a harvest, but I think as was said, let the Lord of the harvest be the one who decides what kind of harvest you're going to get. And Malachi also reads, and I will rebuke you about yeah. for yourselves. Yeah, read that a little bit louder, Aaron. I will rebuke the devour for your sake. Okay. How much time do you need, Henry? How much time do you need? Okay. I want to share a little bit this morning. Do any of you all do this? This is very profitable in the, in the Word, in the study of the Word. Get your concordance, or nowadays you can just use your, your smartphone. Sometimes I like to do it the old-fashioned way. Just get my concordance out. Look up a word. This past week I was meditating on the word deceive, deceit, deceitful, deceivableness. You know, look up all the words. And I looked up the scriptures, and these are some things I found. Here's one if you want to start doing that. Look up the word grace in the concordance and look up the scriptures. And you just simply go through and meditate on God's word. And man, it's just, it just it's life and life more abundantly. What are the sources of deception that we face? What is our guard against deception? And is it possible, let's start with this one. Is it possible for us who are born again children of God to be self-deceived? Is it possible? The answer is yes. Where do we find, I can think of three places in the scriptures where it said, well, there's more. I can think of four right off the bat where we can be self-deceived as born-again children of God. Any ideas? Didn't Jeremiah say, God, you caused me to be deceived? Yeah, you deceived me and I was deceived. There was a time when Jeremiah was under persecution, and I think he was just having a pity party. Because God did not, I say that respectfully because one day I'll meet him. But... uh he was under heavy persecution, and he was just feeling sorry for himself. Now, God did not deceive him. He was a prophet of the Lord. Matter of fact, Jeremiah is maybe, aside from Jesus, he's number one. Jeremiah might be one of my favorite persons in the Bible. Well, he's one of our brothers and sister. He's one of our brothers, part of the great cloud of witnesses. But where's it say in the New Testament? And in my study, I kind of confined it to the New Testament. Where does it say that we can be self-deceived? Anybody? How about Brother James, chapter 1? Let's look there in James, chapter 1. Sometimes I like to call him Pastor James. How would you like to have had a pastor like Brother James? He was, when you read his letter, of course it's God's word. 
but it's, he wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. James chapter 1. Let's begin in verse 22. He says, but be ye doers of the word. Matter of fact, let's read together. Most of us have the King James. Let's read together. Ready? Slowly and thoughtfully. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Stop right there. So all of us under this, in this pavilion, we're hearing God's word today. And Jesus said, the wise, the, the house on the rock and the house on the sand, there's a dividing line between the two. What's the similarity between a person, the house on the rock, the person that builds his life on the rock Christ Jesus, and the person that builds his life on the sand, according to Jesus' word in Matthew 7? Both of those do what? Hear. They both hear, very good, Jacob. Both of them hear God's word. What's the difference between the two? Yeah. The wise man or woman is a habitual doer of God's word and not a hearer only. As a lifestyle, we seek to put God's word into practice. Now, no, don't get under that performance thing, that condemnation thing. None of us are perfect in that. But then also don't use that as a license for sin, a slackness. There's a balance there. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. But so those who habitually as a lifestyle hear God's word and put it into practice they're they're building their life solely on the rock Christ Jesus I'm speaking from Matthew 7 and when the storms of life come against that believer the rain descends the floods come the winds blow the stream arises and he says be he beats vehemently against that person these are the storms of life this is in Matthew 7 also Luke 6 and Matthew 7 it says he will not fall and in Luke 6, he says he's not even shaken. Are you experiencing that? Are you getting to that place? Sometimes when the trials of life come, we're like this. It's the wind and, and the rain, everything's beating against you, and just a little bit for a little while, and then you... In my younger life, I was sort of tossed to and fro. If you're a younger believer, you haven't been born again that long, if you find yourself tossed to and fro with the trials that come against you, take heart, it gets better. If you continue to abide in Jesus and he abides in you, you continually be a diligent, you read God's word, you want to spend time in prayer, you want to worship him, and you want to be a doer of his word, not a hearer only. You, the roots of your being, watch this here, the roots of your being will go down deeper and deeper and deeper in Christ. You'll be like a tree with deep roots. You'll grow up high, spread your branches out wide. And John 15, I'm the vine, you're the branches. You'll bring forth fruit. More fruit, much fruit, and abiding fruit. It gets better. If you find yourself tossed to and fro, as you continue to walk with the Lord, you'll become more and more stable, more and more strong. Less tossed to and fro, like, he, like Jesus said in Luke 6 about the house on the rock, when the storms of life come against you, he says you will not even be shaken, not even shaken in your faith. But this, so... The benefits of doing God's word is you, like the house on the rock. Your life is built on the rock, Christ Jesus. But also here in James 1.22, this is one way. Hear me with all four of your ears. You know you have four ears? Did you ever check that lately? Sarah, do you know you got four ears? What could this mean? What meaneth this? You got physical ears and spiritual ears. This is one way to eliminate all self-deception out of your life. Who is the deceiver of the brethren? Satan, you know, when he led Jesus out in his wilderness temptation, the Bible calls him the tempter. He's also called the deceiver in Revelation 12 and Revelation 20, the one who deceives the whole world. He's, our, he's the enemy of your soul. And if he's going to come and try and deceive me, I certainly do not need to be deceiving myself in that equation. I need to eliminate that one. What do you think, Jesse? As a wise man. So one way to eliminate self-deception, James 1.22, is to be a doer of the word and not just a hearer. Each of us under this pavilion and across this nation this day and across the world, our book believe our believer brothers and sisters like in Australia and Fiji 
They heard God's word this morning before we did. The sun rose over there. We need to make a decision. Are we going to be a diligent doer or a forgetful hearer? Let's continue to read here. Verse, let's read verses 23 to 25 together out loud. Ready? Well, let, let's start in verse 22. But be ye do, doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgets what manner of man he was. But whoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So now you eliminate self-decision, self-deception. Anybody in here want to be blessed in your deed? Anybody in here blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus? Ephesians 1, 3. Every single spiritual blessing that there is in heavenly places, if you're a born-again child of God, you're blessed. There's not a single one up there that you don't have. Now another one, to eliminate self-deception, look at verse 26. I'll read this one. If any man among you seems to be religious and bridles not his tongue, but deceives his own heart, What's it say? This man's religion is vain. vain. What's vain mean? Empty. Empty, useless, worthless. So let's think about that one. Any man among you seems to, in this case, religion is used as a good thing. Devotion to God. In this verse, in this thought here. If any person among you seems to be religious or spiritual or a believer and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Any thoughts on that? How can we, look? let's look on the negative side. How could we be guilty of doing this? Not bridling our tongue, deceiving our own heart, and our religion or our profession is in vain. Gossip. Say it again. Gossip. Gossip. One time I was part of this little fellowship and this little uh, lady who went there, before you know, we got there early, everybody's greeting everybody. And she went around giving these out, very happily with a smile on, the, on her face. And she was giving medicine with a little bit of honey mixed in. And this is what she was giving out to everybody. It says, no gossiping. And she gave them out in the sweetest way with a smile on her face. No, and I keep that as a bookmark in my Bible as a reminder. No gossiping. I've heard it said is slander and gossip is something. Dave, would you come up here, please? Slant, stand right about here. Slander is gossip. Slander and gossip is something that I would say behind David's back, but I wouldn't say it to his face. But, um, and, flat, and flattery is something I would say to his face, but I wouldn't say behind his back. Mm. Okay, thanks. So flattery is bad, and also slander and gossip is bad. We need to be truth tellers. And if I'm talking about David, say I'm talking with two other brothers about David, just, just say for example, I need to talk, say I'm talking to Daniel and Aaron about David. I need to talk as though David's sitting right there. Say David's not, not around. We need to talk about him as though he's sitting right there. Nothing I say in that conversation, I wouldn't say it to his face. So yes, sir, and that's one way we can not bridle our tongue and deceive our own heart. How about this? Does God have a sense of humor? Yes. Did he create us with a sense of humor? Yes. Absolutely. So it's a good thing. Let's establish that. But I grew up in a family where you'd say something that's a little off, a little on the foolish side just to get a laugh, and it would get a laugh. But now, so I was exercised and trained in that. So when I became a Christian, I wanted to put that away, but sometimes I'd get over to the other side where it looked like I was sucking on lemons. I was so tight and so, because you know, I didn't want to talk in foolishness. I wanted to be serious for the Lord, but I was too far over on the other side. There's, there's a middle road here. 
His yoke is easy, his burden is light. The joy of the Lord is your strength. But this foolish talking, Jesus talks about um, in Luke 12, or Matthew 12, put away idle words. Every idle word we speak in this life will give an account on the day of judgment. And also foolish talking in Ephesians 5 is under the same category as uncleanness, covetousness, fornication, and idolatry is foolish talking and jesting. So if I'm exercised in foolish talking or even speaking unbelief, oh, you know, you're going through a trial and you're speaking unbelief. You're speaking the symptoms, the situation, instead of speaking the answer. How in the world, then, a little while later, in Mark 11, where Jesus cursed the fig tree and says, if you believe in your heart and say it with your mouth, you'll say to this, you'll be able to do that. And also say to this mountain, jump into the sea. And the key is you believe it in your heart, you say it with your mouth. Now, though Jesus is the Lord of your confession, you can't just make it up anything you want to do. You get what I'm saying? <clears throat> So getting back to verse 26, which also goes with James chapter 3, taming the tongue. No man can tame the tongue in his own strength, but by the Holy Spirit in you, you can and you must tame that tongue. Just like the rudder of a ship, just like the bridle of a horse, so that tongue is like the rudder of your life. And that tongue can be used against you if you speak doubt and unbelief and cursing but it can, be, can work for you and others as you speak blessing, as you speak God's word. Any thoughts on these two points right here? So as we are doers of the word and not hearers only, verse 22. And as verse 26, as we bridle our tongue, these are two ways to eliminate self-deception out of your life. Two ways. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. Let's begin in verse 2. It says, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if any man thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he what? Deceives his own self. But let every man prove his own work. Verse 4, then he will have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. What does this mean in verse 2, that we're to bear other people's burdens, and verse 5, that we're to bear our own burden? What does this mean? Verse 2, we're to bear one another's burdens, and that's fulfilling the law of Christ, which is the law of love. Then in verse 5, we're to bear our own burden. Any thoughts on that? David said he likes that. There's plenty to reach around if you do that. So I'm to bear my own burden. What is, our, what is your own burden that you're to bear? What is that? What, what, what comes under that category? What do you think? Talents and abilities. Where's Ephraim at? What Ephraim was touching on this morning in Matthew 25 and Luke 19. Matthew 25, one guy was given five, one, two, and one, one talent. Luke 19, each one was given one. That's a picture of judgment day. When Jesus returns with his kingdom and sets up his kingdom on the earth, we will stand before him at the judgment seat of Christ to give an account for our life. And the guy who made five, the guy who got five made five, the guy who got two made two, and what Jesus says to them is the first word I want to hear out of his mouth when I stand before him. It starts with a W. Let's say it together. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many. Enter into the joy of your Lord. 
I believe the standard by which we shall be judged, because those guys, it was each according to their individual ability. One guy got five, one got two, another got one. On Judgment Day, as you stand before him to give an account for your life, I believe this is the standard and the measure of judgment by which we shall be judged. Jesus is going to want to know, what did you do with what I entrusted you? If I'm the guy that got two, and that, that includes all that I am and all that I have. Physically, all that I am and all that I have, my person, my being, my money, my everything, possessions, and all that I am spiritually, the gifts and talents God has given me. How about your time? Are we going to give an account for our time? We need to redeem the time and not waste it. So that's bearing your own burden. What's it mean to bear one another's burden and so fulfill the law of Christ in verse 2, Galatians 6, 2? What does that mean? Well, I believe it refers to verse 1. Go ahead and read that loud and clear, David. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fold, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself lest thou also be tempted. Any insight on that? Well, I think the burdens are um, a fold. Mm -hmm. Can be. Can be. David's saying the burden is a fault. Somebody's caught on a fault, a trespass, we're to bear that burden. There's a certain burden that each of us are called to carry. Jesus, and what did Jesus say? My yoke is easy and my burden is light. When you're yoked together with Jesus, it's the grace of yielding to the greater one who lives in you. But the yoke of man-made religion, which it doesn't matter what denomination or what group you're in or coming, or coming out of or have come out of, whatever denomination it is, whatever the name is of that group, each one has their own man-made religion. Every, every single one of them does. And the commonality is that yoke is not easy and that burden is not light. But Jesus' yoke is easy and his burden is light. So bear one another's burdens. Basically, let, let's confess together John 13, 34, and 35. Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto you. I think we know this. Jesus said, let's go. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. There's the law of Christ right there. As we bear one another's burdens, we're going to be walking in that love. That self-sacrificial, lay your life down. Jesus said, no greater love has a man than this, than what? A man lays down his life for his friends. Let's go to another one. Okay, so, verse 3, if I think myself to be something when I'm nothing, I deceive my own self. These days in the body of Christ, now I'm going to exaggerate to make a point, all right? Sometimes Jesus did that. It seems like every third person claims to be an apostle or prophet. I'm exaggerating some, but it's there. And a lot of them are not apostles or prophets. Do we have true apostles and prophets today? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. So there's the true there are those who claim to be and are not, and I believe some of those who are claiming to be that, they're called to be that, but they're still in training. They're not demonstrating and manifesting that gift yet. But if I claim myself to be something when I'm nothing, when I'm not that, I'm deceiving myself. Now in Christ, in the Messiah, I know who I am and what I am. I know the spiritual giftings he's given me. I believe there's some more on the way as I continue to walk in obedience. And I, I abide in that. I'm, I'm satisfied in that as a teacher in the body of Christ. I've learned, here's a life lesson, don't try to be something you're not. Don't try to be somebody that you're not. But by all means, by the grace of God, be the person and the person in the body of Christ that God has called you and gifted you and anointed you and appointed you and sent you to be. Be that person and be it to the max as you abide in the Messiah. 
So here's another way to eliminate self-deception out of our life. Let's look down a little further here in Galatians 6, uh, verse 7. Here once again is the word deceived. He says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, the Amplified here says, that and that only will he reap. For he that sows to the flesh shall from the flesh reap corruption. The Amplified says decay, ruin, and destruction. But he that sows to the Spirit shall from the Spirit reap everlasting life. Now here is very important, verse 9. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we what? If we, there's a, there's a uh, period of time, I'm not telling you guys anything. There's a period of time between seed time and harvest, is there not? You know this. You know this matter perfectly. In the spirit, there's a, there's a time of between seed time, planting, planting to the spirit. You'll from the spirit reap everlasting life. That doesn't mean you'll make it into heaven. That means you're going to experience, which we are. On, we are. If you're born again, you have eternal life now. Your name is written in the book of life. You have the gift of salvation by grace through faith, free gift. And when you breathe your last, you're in. But in this scripture here is talking about reaping. Everlasting life, the Zoe life of God, experiencing life and life more abundantly, which Jesus came to give us. But there's one, there's one way for crop failure between planting to the Spirit and reaping from the Spirit, and that's in verse 9. He says, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Is that not, okay, let's, let's use this here. Here's seed time. Here's harvest. With planting corn, what's the, the waiting time see, between seed time and harvest, usually? 90 to 120 days. 90 to 120 days, so three to four months. In the spirit, we, we, don't, all, we don't know that. We don't know how long it's going to be to harvest. We just got to keep on. Is this not where the tempter comes to tempt you to give up? to cast away your confidence, to let go of the confession of your faith. Hebrews 10, about verse whatever, says, hold fast to the confession of your faith without wavering, because God is faithful who promised. Is this not where the tempter comes in and says, it's not working. It's not going to work. It worked for others, but it's not going to work for you. God's not going to... You know, He's not going to come through for you. You're standing and believing on His word. You're confessing His word. He's not going to come through for you. He's going to let you high and dry. You look like a fool in the process. Do we not know whose voice that is? He wants to get us to give up, to cast away our confidence, to let go of our faith. And here we are with a face-to-face -face relationship with the Lord and just, just, just come over here and just sit down and just give up. Here, we're in the race. Running the race with faith and patience, the race that is set before you. If we give in to that temptation, we're just like, yeah, I guess it's not going to work. God hasn't heard me. He's not going to come through. His, his word worked for Henry, but it's not going to work for me. That is the tempter who's also a liar. Jesus said he's a liar and there's no truth in him because he's the father of lies. Now let's look at something here. And also verse 10 says, as we have therefore opportunity, there's chance for more sowing of which you'll reap later. Let us do a good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. The law of sowing and reaping, when you hear this, what's the, there's two sides, the good side and the bad side. When you hear this, when somebody says, you know, you're going to reap what you sow, which side do you usually think of first, the good side or bad side? Bad side, usually, yeah. It depends how they say it, too. You're going to reap what you sow. <laughs> you know. Depends how it comes out. But oftentimes our mind goes, so he says, do not be deceived. Verse 7, I will not be mocked. 
whatever a man sows, that and that only is what he will reap. Here's this, let's talk about the bad side first. I would be self-deceived. This is how we can be self-deceived. When you're tempted to sin, when you're tempted to go off track, you're tempted to do things you know you shouldn't do, and here's the temptation. How does the tempter come to you at a time like that? What does he say to you? What are the thoughts that come to you? Anybody? You're being tempted to sin, and what are the thoughts that come to your mind that would sort of want to push you off and do that? What's that? Yeah, it's okay. You're not doing anything wrong. Who else? Nobody will find it out. Nobody will find it out. I can do this in the dark and nobody will know. Who else? You can repent later. You can repent later. I'll only do it once. I'll, yeah, that's a good one. I only do it once. Yeah. If we give in to this, we're self-deceived. And God says, don't be deceived. I will not be mocked. You give in to the flesh, you'll from the flesh reap decay, ruin, and destruction. Now, we can go confess our sin after we do it, but there's still a harvest coming. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, about verse 13, it says, Abstain from fleshly lust that what? War against, War against the soul. I've noticed that when I've compromised, when I give in to temptation, when I sin, call it what it is, yeah, I, I've came back and I said, Lord, forgive me, I shouldn't have said that or I shouldn't have did that. My sins are forgiven instantly. Hebrews 10.18 says, I'll be merciful to your unrighteousness and your sins and iniquities I remember no more. So as soon as you confess your sin, 1 John 1.9, let's say that together, 1 John 1.9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As soon as you confess your sin, God has forgiven you and cleansed you right there. In Hebrews 10, 18, he's merciful to your unrighteousness and your sins and iniquities he remembers no more, he forgets it. But what I have noticed, 1 Peter 2, 13, abstain from fleshly lusts at war against the soul. I'm going to have some of that soul warfare for a while. That's part of reaping, sowing to the flesh and reaping from the flesh corruption. And that's not God condemning you and beating you down. That's, you open the door of the enemy and the enemy's pounding on you for a season. And he has legal ground to do that. Now, don't get under condemnation, but the next time you're being tempted to sin and you're starting to weaken and sort of, just remember that. A harvest will be coming. Thank God that harvest, depending on what the sin is, a lot of times that harvest has a beginning and an end. That season, it'll, it'll end. Some are for life. Some are for life. Somebody goes out and commits murder. Adultery, whatever. But now let's look on the positive side. You sow to the Spirit, you shall from the Spirit reap everlasting life. God says, don't be deceived. I will not allow myself to be mocked. I see that you're sowing to my Spirit. You're walking in obedience. You're walking in the Word. You're partnering together with me, doing the work that I've called you to do. You've kept your hand to the plow and you're plowing, not looking to the left or right, not looking back. Don't allow yourself to be deceived into thinking that you're not going to reap from the Spirit a harvest of everlasting life. If I allow that to happen, I will be mocked and I will not allow myself to be mocked. You know, isn't that where the enemy comes, like we said before? You're walking in obedience. You're sowing to the Spirit. You're doing what He's got, you know, told you to do, being a doer of the Word. And there's a time between seed time and harvest. The enemy wants to come along and get you to quit and give up your faith. Be weary and faint and give up. Hold fast to your faith. Hold fast to your Father and my Father and your God and my God. Hold fast to your confession of your faith without wavering because he is faithful, that promise. That's Hebrews 10, about 23 or so. Because God will, not, God will not allow himself to be mocked by you continuing to sow to the Spirit and not reap from the Spirit a harvest of everlasting life. So there's a couple of ways we can be deceived here. We can be deceived on the 
to, oh, I can just do this little sin and it won't, hey, I'm strong, I can handle this, this won't hurt too much. Uh, uh, but also on the positive side too, you're sowing to the Spirit, an enemy comes to deceive you and you agree with him, uh, this ain't going to work, this isn't doing any good, I'm not going to get no harvest, God's not going to hear me, he's not coming through. Don't allow yourself to be pulled over there. Stand firm and see the salvation of God. Yes, ma'am. Well, getting, getting back to that. Okay, you, you give in to temptation, you sin. You confess your sin right away. God forgives you. 1 John 1, 9 cleanses you from all unrighteousness. Hebrews 10, 18, he forgets it. But in 1 Peter 2, 13, he says, abstain from fleshly lust that war against the soul. Yeah, you can resist. There, okay, let's go through this. So you, you, say I just give in to temptation, I sin. I confess my sin. God has forgiven me. God has cleansed me, but I've opened the door to warfare in my soul according to 1 Peter 2.13. Now, you, you resist that because once you confess your sin, God has forgiven it. Yes, that's taken away legal ground. That might not be the right word I use there. But still, you're going to reap for a season from the flesh corruption, decay, ruin, and destruction, verse 8, because he said so. But now the enemy comes to pound you with condemnation. Resist him right away. Resist him right away with, let's say, uh, Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. You know, in the Greek, the period's right there. It's believed that the rest of that who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit was added in there. Fear not, that's down in verse 4 of Romans 8. I'm going to start to wind this down. I want to soon hand it over to Henry. But these are, let me just bring this to a conclusion here. The two places in James 1 and the two places in Galatians 6 is how we can eliminate self-deception from our lives. And our Father knows, we don't need to have, I don't need to have self-deception working in my life when the, the deceiver, the enemy of my soul is also come working against me. As you are a doer of God's word, not a hearer only, James 1.22. James 1.26, as you bridle your tongue, and here in Galatians, the two examples, eliminate self-deception out of your life, I have found that life just goes a whole lot better. Have you not found that? Amen. Yes. And you're able to grow from strength to strength and go on from glory to glory. Henry, I'm going to turn it over to you.